So I should tell you, I'm a, a filmmaker, but originally I trained as a neuroscientist. Now, what is a, a neuroscientist doing being interested in uh, people growing food? Now, it's not as disconnected as you might think. I don't know how many of you here live in cities. If you just want to give me an indication. Okay, pretty much everybody. There's a few that don't. Uh, how many of you um, have nearby some green space, some park that you walk through every, that you walk through every day? Okay. Uh, how many of you could say that you know your next door neighbour by name? And the neighbour on the other side? Keep your hands up if you know another neighbour. Four neighbours. Five neighbours. Six. Ten. Oh, so those two at the back. Um, where do you live? Where's that? Armley and Leeds and if you go and live where they go, they're the people to know because there's a link between your mental health, the urban space around you and the number of people that you know in your local neighbourhood. So that's how I'm kind of interested in uh, this particular journey. Um, and the other thing to think about, uh, my role on this particular project, Everyday Growing Cultures, if you don't know lots of your neighbours, you don't walk through a park every day, um, don't worry about it too much because this project will uh, give you a few ideas as to what you might be able to do. Now our story starts with a very visionary researcher and allotment holder, Farida Viz. Now Farida, fortunately for me, lives around the corner in Manchester, but she works at the University of Sheffield. And... Um, this is Farida on her allotment. The great thing about working with someone like Farida on a research project or a community project is that you will get lots of apples, lots of homemade jam, and lots of courgettes, and more courgettes, and many more courgettes, and it kind of goes on with the courgettes. Uh, fortunately, we, we learned quite a few courgette recipes, so we didn't have to eat lots and lots of the same thing. Um, but one of the great things about Farida is um, she on her allotment noticed that the waiting list, because she was the secretary of her allotment in Manchester, she noticed that the waiting list was going up and up and up. It was two months uh, to get an allotment when she first uh, got an allotment 15 years ago, and it's now around 12 to 15 years, which is kind of strange. And there's this trend around the country where there's increase in, in, in waiting list to get an allotment, but there's also a reduction in the number of allotment plots that are available to people. So what happens if you want to grow your own food and you can't get an allotment? So there were two things that Farida did. The first was with her student, Yana. She um, used the freedom of information requests to send um, requests to councils around the count country to release data on how long the waiting lists were, what your rent might be, uh, what your water rates might be on allotments around the country. Now that data was published on the Guardian blog, I don't know if anyone here saw that. Um, but what that meant is that there was useful data to people that were interested in allotments to find out about what are the differences around the country and where I live. The next thing she did, which I thought was really in inspiring, was to think about what are some citizen-led approaches to grow your own food if you can't get an allotment. Um, there are a few people that she found out about who were kind of, um, they were camping out on the allotment that they couldn't get a, a plot at, and they were kind of, you know, being quite activists, and they decided they wanted to uh, stay on that plot. They should have got some land, and they shouldn't have to wait so long. So she, she was finding these people that were doing interesting uh, ways to get their own land, perhaps not in quite legal ways. Um, and then Kirsten enters our story. Now, Kirsten, based in Manchester at the Kindling Trust, now they're an NGO and they support Greater Manchester and us to think about and actually to, to find ways in which we can uh, grow food and find places that we might be able to source seasonal and local and organic food. And they have a map on their website so you can have a look to see if I want to be more sustainable, well I would buy my, my groceries from here uh, and so on and so forth. But the challenge with that is not everyone uses that map, so the information's there but people don't always know about it. Um, and then the other thing that um, the Kinning Dress had done, um, they were in touch with Danny in Sheffield. Now, Danny was doing a similar thing through his Grow Sheffield network, and they'd been mapping out local and seasonal food. And Danny had been interested in the same question. How can we encourage that people could grow 
more, um, find places where they could grow more food. And Kirsten had come across this particular website called 596 Acres. I don't know if anyone here has heard about it. Um, but this particular website, what it does is it maps out physical, physically and online places where there are empty lots uh, or vacant lots. So if you imagine that outside where none of that was there, um, that might be a place that you could say, oh, we could grow food there. And it did that across New York and in Brooklyn. And it meant that if you're a local resident, you could look online and you could see a vacant lot near you. But you could also see which of your neighbours were also interested in that plot. And you could come together and uh, create a community garden. So she wondered, could we bring this technology to Manchester and map out ways in which we could find places to grow food? Uh, fortunately, Manchester is not a massive place and there's a very creative community who are quite well connected. Uh, she met Stephen Flower. I don't know if the flower bit uh, kind of made that connection for her, but she got in touch with Stephen, and Stephen, I don't know if you've heard of Open Data Manchester, I think they gave a, a TEDx talk, Julian Tate gave a TEDx talk last year or the year before. Um, one of the things that they're interested in is how can we make data useful to citizens by opening, up, opening it up so that we can get access to things like health data, transport data, and even places where we might uh, grow food. But you need to visualise that data. You need to find ways to make it useful to people. So she talked to Stephen. He looked at the website. I don't know if there's any coders here. OK, that's good. That's good. I can get away with it. Oh, there's one. OK, I won't say too much. He's the expert. Um, he looked at the website and the code that encoded that website, and he thought, OK, could we uh, use the code that encodes this website and transfer it to Manchester? Innovation done. Boom. We can do that in Manchester. Now, unfortunately, it didn't quite translate. So the, the data was out there. We tried to transfer it. It didn't quite work. You know, zip codes, postcodes. Computer said no. We needed to think about another way to do that. So Stephen thought about ways in which we could come up different ways to do that. Um, and one of them was actually to just go out and walk. And let's go and have a look at places in our neighbourhood. So this is Old Trafford. Um, the way to think about Old Trafford is probably Manchester United. That's what most people remember about that place. But it's a very culturally diverse place. And as it happens, I live in Old Trafford. Um, and so we went out and we were mapping spaces in Manchester, just taking photographs, and then um, we were looking at kind of uh, aspect ratio, so which direction the sun is facing, north and south. Is there a water supply, so a draining pipe on an adjoining house? Uh, is there security? That kind of thing. And we just noted this down on bits of paper, and then um, Stephen uh, made us aware of this particular um, bit of technology, which is called CrowdMap and it's uh, made by you, Shahidi, and it's usually used for crisis mapping. And so what we could do is we could upload our photographs and our reports on the places that we could uh, find and, and grow food. And um, we came across 82 sites over two walks with 26 residents. And OK, we didn't come up with 596 acres. We came up with 5.2 acres. But that's, that's still quite a lot of land, and it's probably quite a lot of food. Um, in Sheffield, uh, Danny from Sheffield came to one of the Manchester workshops, so he saw what we'd done and he thought, yeah, well, this is good, but I'm not that interested in using CrowdMap and I'm not that interested in doing all these reports, but what he did was to map out a walk of spaces. He's a, he's a local lad, so he'd mapped out spaces that they could have a look at in Sheffield. Um, and one of the things that Danny said that as he walked around that he wasn't just noticing empty lots, he was noticing uh, cherry trees where you could perhaps forage from those trees. He was also noticing um, where the houses were and thinking there's no point growing food where no one lives because there's going to be no one to look after that food. Um, and at the end of these workshops that we had in Manchester and Sheffield, there came a point where I, as a filmmaker, I could feel there was a bit of a lull in the room because we realised that there was loads of work to do to get to the point of mapping out places to grow food, to getting the permission from the council to do the next step and actually, you know, and get the boxes in and, you know, detoxify the soil. All of that, it felt like a lot. Um, and I felt that we needed some inspiration. So the next journey in the film, um, this lady, uh, it's worth watching the film just to hear her accent. Uh, Wendy Brower, she's an artist and, and an activist. And uh, many years ago, in the 90s, I believe, she came up with an open map system called Green Map, which has kind of spread 
all around the world. So ha worth having a look at that. But she, in the Lower East Side of New York, had been looking at a particular plot of land near where she lived that she could grow her own food. But she couldn't get, find anyone to help her uh, to, to, to open up that lot. Um, but she used 596 acres, she found some neighbours, she got to know those neighbours and they decided they were going to make that into a community garden. And lo and behold, we were there on the day that that community garden opened. So we could take Wendy's story and how they went about it, how they detoxified the land, got rid of the rats, uh, brought in the soil, worked together, uh, applied for funding, did lots of community organising and took that story back to the UK. Now, um, the story goes a little bit further in, in New York because I met... Um, I was on a bus and I was chatting about the Growing Cultures project and Daryl happened to be sitting in a seat in front of me and when I got off the bus, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, oh, um, you're talking about this growing thing. I've actually got a, uh, an urban farm that's been going for 15 years in Brooklyn. Do you want to come and see it? And I was like, yes, that would be great. So we had another kind of layer of inspiration by going to visit Daryl. Now, Daryl's in, in, in Brooklyn, and it's an urban farm, it's not a garden, but what that garden does, I don't know if anyone here's got an allotment, the challenge is to keep <coughs> your allotment going. In this farm, you can get the tools and the resources from the farm to start your gardening, learn how to do it, and then they help you open up your own community garden. Now, the thing that really inspired me about Daryl's story was... This came out of the activism around housing and a kind of a sense of hopelessness, really. Um, it's quite a, it was a drug-ridden area. There was, there was a community centre that was working really hard to kind of keep crime down and kind of keep people's spirits up. But they cleared out an empty lot at the back of the community centre, uh, got rid of the drug needles, got rid of the rats, uh, and, and made this farm. And, you know, his key to us was... To keep it going, you actually need to take action. You need to do something. It's not about the technology, the mapping, the this. We didn't have any of that. Um, and so that was a really inspiring thing for us to take back to Manchester and to Sheffield. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to kind of leave you with was uh, a quote that comes from Wendy. And she said to us, um, you know, if we work together in the garden, we can work together in crisis. They just suffered from a, a hurricane. And uh, that garden was very close to the flooding there um, in New York. And so it was really important for them to, to get this garden off the ground. Um, so I hope that you can see that with some pens, some maps and some very simple technology, some cooking as well, uh, and talking and sharing stories, there, is, there are possibilities um, in our cities uh, to be more resilient. Um, in Old Trafford, uh, we're going to try and keep it going. We've got a few resident meetings coming up. I think some trees are being planted next week. If you're in the UK, there are community gardens across the country um, that will be open tomorrow that you can go and visit. So just Google Big Dig and you'll, you'll find uh, a garden near you. Thanks so much to all of the partners involved. It takes too long to, to mention them all, but thanks so much for inviting me to come along and speak. If there's one wish that I'd have uh, for cities, uh, in 2050, that would be that every kid and every adult tastes some food uh, that they've, they've grown themselves and, and share that meal with others. And if um, I'd love it if you would share these stories more widely. Uh, you can use the Growing Cultures hashtag. Might be a bit of a clash of hashtags. There's several going around. But share your stories, of uh, connect with this more widely and, I don't know, maybe tell it to your neighbours. Thanks very much. <laughs>